Good evening, everyone. My name is Casey Foster. I'm the co-executive director at Partners for Dignity and Rights, and I will be your moderator tonight for this uh, exciting and what I'm sure is going to be riveting conversation between our panelists um, and our guests. Um, I would like to start by thanking everyone for being here with us tonight. I know there are many, many places um, people could be right now. And so we really appreciate you sharing your time with us and joining us for this conversation tonight. Um, before we get started, I'd like to first introduce um, our distinguished uh, panelists for the night. Um, we have Rafaela Rodriguez from the Worker Social Responsibility Network with us. Rafaela, uh, prior to joining the Worker Social Responsibility Network, Rafaela worked for over seven years in various national and international settings as an advocate working alongside human trafficking survivors, migrants, and undocumented communities. In 2016, she supported the implementation of the second national worker social responsibility program in the dairy industry in Vermont, New York. We also have Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard with us, who's a professor of community justice and social economic development in the Department of Africana Studies at the distinguished John Jay College at the City University of New York, where I am a uh, honored alumni um, from City College. So excited to have Dr. Gordon Nemhard with us. Uh, she's also the recipient of many awards and honors. The list is too long um, to name tonight, um, but she also is the author of many publications and books including uh, Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. Our final panelist for the night is Dr. Raj Patel, who's a research professor in the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, Dr. Patel is also the recipient of many honors and awards, including the James Beard Foundation Leadership Award, is a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, his first book was Stuff and Starved, The Hidden Battle for the World Food System. His second, The Value of Nothing, was a New York Times international bestseller. And he's the co-author with Jason W. Moore, A History of the World and Seven Cheap Things. His latest book uh, is entitled Inflamed, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. And his first film, The Ants and Grasshoppers, can be seen now. We are Super excited to have uh, each of them joining us tonight. Uh, we promise that tonight's conversation is going to be a conversation that's full for our guests, and we promise to open up space uh, for all of our attendees to ask questions towards the end. And sorry, give me one second because I am having a technical issue with my computer, Zoom, sorry, I'm running a little. Uh, Casey, would you like me to step in and just uh, do a quick grounding moment here while you troubleshoot? Yeah, sorry. So I, I would. Uh, so let me jump in. I'm having a little bit of uh, internet issues on my end, but um, so we'd like Dr. Patel uh, Raj to ground us a little bit tonight, as everyone is aware of all the things going on around us in the world, the war in Ukraine. There's almost there's also numerous conflicts and wars uh, impacting millions of people from. Ethiopia to Sudan to Yemen to Syria, all over the world, and and that has an impact also on our food systems, um, both in the countries where there is war and conflict, um, and the most vulnerable and marginalized countries across the world. And we were hoping, Dr. Patel, you can kind of ground us um, in the, in what that means um, for all of us. Uh, th thank you, Casey, and you, uh, you 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 put it very eloquently already that you know we are in this moment of of conflict, of climate change, of COVID, of living through the long tail of colonialism and capitalism, and they've already created waves of global hunger. And now with the war in Ukraine, uh, on top of that, uh, if the worst is realized, then 830 million people will be mal malnourished 
around the world, in, in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, in the Americas, and here uh, on the stolen land of Turtle Island. Um, so if you could just take a moment to reconnect to the ground beneath your feet and remember where and when we are right now and how we stand on the shoulders of our fallen comrades. And I, I want to take a, a moment actually to, just to say a, a prayer for one of the land defenders, uh, for my comrade Ayanda Ngila, um, who's, uh, uh, who was a 30-year-old leader in the Abashlali Basem Jondolo Shack Dwellers movement in South Africa, uh, and who was laying down some irrigation tape in the Ekenana settlement in Durban uh, just a couple of weeks back so that his community could eat. And he was killed by the ruling party uh, because his model of care and of love uh, was a threat. So if you can, uh, let's just take a minute to, to breathe together, to join together, to reconnect with where we find ourselves, uh, to recognize that this moment of, of crisis is a moment of struggle and to recognize uh, the ancestors over our shoulders and the carers in movements around the world in whose arms together with love, we will prevail. Ashe, and thank you for that grounding. So modern capitalist food systems have become major sources of labor exploitation, poor health, climate change, ecological destruction, profiteering, animal abuse, cultural erasure. And as you heard from Dr. Patel are impacting millions of people around the world. Um, and those that are most marginalized communities, most vulnerable communities are feeling that impact the most. And with that said, um, with how challenging things are, um, there's also, been and continues to be inspiring organizing around transforming our food systems to be more equitable, to be just, um, to be more democratic. And so we really wanna have a conversation with our panelists tonight, both about the history and the challenges that we face, but also about the hope that people are seeing from the work that's happening, whether it's in central Florida or anywhere uh, in upstate New York or anywhere really transnationally across the globe where people are really looking at this struggle around food systems as an entryway into creating a more just system, as an entryway, not just to dismantling, but to building something new, right? There's a lot of talk about what needs to be broken down, what needs to be dismantled, but we really need to focus on what we need to build and what people are transforming every day in their organizing and their work. And I would love to have uh, our first question uh, with Jessica which is the global industrial food system we have today is historically recent creation, but the US is home to many rich food traditions. Can you talk about some of the struggles that black Americans have been subjected to in our agricultural and food systems? What food sovereignty means and some of the ways that black communities are drawing on traditions to cultivate food sovereignty today? Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to be here with everybody. Um, I also want to do a land acknowledgement, acknowledge our right to land and resources, acknowledge our ancestors, um, and also talk about, you know, resistance and um, how, you know, how we have always resisted and um, struggled for our humanity. And so hopefully I can tell you a little bit about some of those struggles from my research with African American mutual aid and cooperatives. Um, and really those movements start, you know, in many ways with food security, with agriculture, land ownership and health. Those are sort of the major issues the way where people came together to pool what they had to make sure they could address this. So we know, you know, that Africans even on the slave ships, right, were doing things to help each other and to support each other and to maintain their humanity. Once they were literally on US, what was, would become US soil and on the ground, right? Some of the very early things they did was uh, do kitchen gardens together. Because again, right, as enslaved people, they didn't own their own bodies. They weren't getting enough food or care, right? But on that one day off that they had, they would garden together to make sure they had some extra food, some extra things. So that's sort of the very first way that I know that we can think about attention to food security and recognizing the need to help each other to make sure um, we weren't as malnourished as the, the masters, the people who owned our bodies were trying to make us, right? And then it moves from there between agriculture co-ops, food co-ops, other kinds of uh, collective ways. I want to talk about a couple of the interesting struggles um, 
and how, you know, again, how we asserted ourselves as human beings to make sure that the ways that we address social reproduction and food security was in uh, very collective, humane ways. I think about uh, the women of the Kumbahi River Colony or Cumbi, I think is actually how they, what they, how they pronounce it in South Carolina during the Civil War after Harriet Tubman liberates their area. Most of their able-bodied men join the Union Army. The women are left uh, on lands that they have taken over from the white landowners and they farm, make crafts together. And for the last three years of the Civil War, two and a half years of the Civil War, they're running those plantations. They're not plantations anymore, but they're running those, those farms and those plantations as collectives and making sure that everybody eats well. The, the uh, handicapped, the children, the elderly are all eating well and able to really use that land that they had been so um, so oppressed on just you know months earlier or years earlier. Um, you then have the, um, uh, so that's civil war before that, sorry, I had meant to um, talk about, oh no, sorry, I did talk about the mutual aid already. Then uh, during reconstruction, the 1880s, we've got the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Movement, which is a really fascinating movement to combine labor, women's rights, integration rights, populist movement and cooperative development. And again, mixing farmers who own their own land and farm workers in an organization together, which became the largest black organization in US history. So again, this notion of right that we have to make, we have to have land ownership, we have to be in charge of our own food systems, et cetera, starts way back early on. We can then look in the 1920s, even before the Great Depression, we had the National Association of Colored Farmers, again, looking to stabilize African-American farm ownership, improve farm living, use cooperative buying, production and marketing. They helped members to buy farms, to get better legal sharecropping contracts if they couldn't buy farms and to really be able to make a living through farming. Um, and so again, this notion of that the ways to do food security is to do it together, to do it, pool, you know, pool whatever resources we have, argue for our rights, but focus on land ownership, food production, that kind of thing. Um, we can fast forward to uh, the 60s and 70s with the formation of the uh, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, similar notion, right, that we need, this time it's a regional organization throughout the South to help make sure that Black folks and people of color and low-income people had access to sustainable farming, to land ownership, et cetera. Um, and that organization still exists today, celebrating its what, 50 something, 55th anniversary or something this year. Um, and I, also in the 1970s, we've got a Fannie Lou Hamer who's you know known better or originally was known for her work with SNCC and doing uh, voter registration and voting rights. But she very quickly realized that without economic independence and economic democracy, we wouldn't, you know, even voting rights are hollow. She and her husband were sharecroppers. They get thrown off their land because they registered to vote. She forms a, a cooperative in a cooperative land owning and farming and cooperative farms so that people wouldn't be beholden to sharecroppers and wouldn't be retaliated against if they were involved in civil rights stuff. So she also believed in cooperative ownership, land ownership, farming, right? We have to control our own food systems. And so, you know, we can move all the way up to a, a group like Mandela Foods Cooperative in West Oakland, a worker cooperative that's a grocery store. But again, this notion that we need to own our own businesses, control our own food supply. They work with other groups in the community to do uh, an African farmer's market. They work with a credit union and other partnerships to make sure that food access is right there available in their neighborhood. And so I just wanted to lift those things up. There's also later we can talk about examples of young people doing this also, doing school gardens and understanding the importance, right, of land and creating our own food and controlling our own food supplies in order to both make their own and their families' lives better, but also right to strengthen our communities.
Thank you for that. And I think there's a number of takeaways that we're going to get to later in this conversation, just for people to kind of hold with you now, you know, one around land ownership, right, but the other around cooperative land ownership, right, and so there's a form of land ownership now, which is individualized and not collective at all, and who's benefiting from the current, you know, um, form of land ownership that we have, not just prevalent here in the U.S., but prevalent throughout the, the world, and then um, the other is about who's in charge of our food systems, right? And so we're going to get back to those two pieces later in this conversation, but I just want our attendees to kind of hold that. I want to um, pose our next question uh, to Raj, which is from COVID to climate change, to workers' rights, to, to racism, to, to inequities, there are, about, there are challenges and there are battles on a lot of fronts these days. Um, can you talk about why the food system is an important face place for us to be engaged in struggle? Well, uh, th and thanks for that question, Casey. And it's it's such an honor to be in this conversation, um, precisely because you know, here we are in year two of of COVID, uh, you know, surviving the sort of fictions of the ruling class that everything's fine, uh, and. The fact is that uh, you know the, the COVID made things substantively worse for the working class uh, in uh, in the United States, and it was only you know weirdly through moments of protest and outrage that that some of that was blunted, uh, and that we only have. 40 million Americans who are food insecure at the moment. And that's meant to be some sort of victory uh, in the moment we find ourselves. But the fact is that, that all of these issues are deeply interwoven. And you can tell that from a couple of stylized facts. One, for instance, is that seven out of the 10 worst paying jobs in America are in the food system. Uh, and that's, you know, that's not surprising because that's the history of America, isn't it? Um, uh, and that's the history of, of modern capitalism that relies on uh, workers uh, kicked off land and then uh, either forcibly enslaved uh, or you know, have and, and th th that land forcibly appropriated through colonialism uh, or through you know, just the displacements of militarism and of just regular class war. Uh, workers are fo forced to sell their labor on land that uh, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, holdings get bigger and bigger. Uh, and so you know, it, it's not surprising that seven out of the 10 worst paying jobs in America are in the food system because that's the way the game has always been set up. Uh, this isn't an accident. It's not a, a bug in the food system. It's a feature. It's it's always been part of the story of the food system. Um, and then you need to look at, well, who was it that was in the front lines of COVID? Uh, whose bodies were tossed into the flames so that the middle class could sit at home and uh, get DoorDash? Um, well, of course, it was the bodies of um, pre, uh, you know, disproportionately people of color. Uh, you know, if you look here in Texas at the two hotspots for COVID in the first year, uh, it was in the prisons and in the meatpacking plants, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, here in Texas, the state that fought for slavery twice how is this surprising at all? It, it, it shouldn't be at all surprising that uh, the way that the food system works is through various kinds of intersections of uh, patriarchy, of racism, uh, and of, of, uh, of capitalist colonial class warfare. Um, and then you know, at the other side of the food system, we've got America's biggest farmer. You know, the, the man who owns more farmland than anyone else in America is Bill Gates. Uh, and that's not an accident either. That's part, that's a, a sign of the way that our food system is being transformed away from the kinds of local control of uh, you know, cooperatively controlled supply chains that in, in which workers are empowered every step of the way, and we have an ecosystem that isn't going to kill us. Um, and uh, instead, we move towards Bill Gates's model of farming, in which farmers rent the land, toil, and you know, uh, provide an asset for for Bill Gates to park his billions, but also give him uh, an added income. It's like gold with yield, right? Uh, in the in the words of Madeleine Fairbairn. Um, and this is uh, a, a way in which. You know, farmers find themselves trapped within a system uh, in which they are forced to exploit the land and forced to exploit labor uh, because of the sort of machinations of capitalism. So if we're interested in overturning uh, these systems, then we need to be very conscious about organizing across race. We need to be conscious that this is a working class effort against um, the, you know, the Bill Gateses. Uh, and we also be, need to be conscious about patriarchy here. And, you know, I mean, I'll be flaying it out of myself for as long as I live. Uh, but the fact is that this is a patriarchal system. If you look at who's going hungry in the United States, you can see that written very clearly. Uh, you know, uh, one in three single single headed uh, households or female headed households are food insecure in the United States. Uh, and 
the great source of hope for me is that movements recognize this, you know, movements for food sovereignty, which is about, um, you know, uh, having uh, community decision making around food policy in, uh, in our communities. What that turned into was a recognition really driven by uh, peasant women uh, in the international peasant movement, La Villa Campesina, uh, that you can't have food sovereignty without an end to all forms of violence against women. Uh, and so, you know, if we are serious about the transformation towards moving towards food sovereignty, then we have theory, we have movements, uh, and we have, you know, really important models to follow, not just in the United States, but globally. Uh, and we should be thinking globally because parochialism is a problem here in America. But uh, I, I think that, you know, it's important to understand that, you know, the, the categories of race, class, and gender are only taught separately in sociology classes, but they are experienced all the time simultaneously, and the, the movement needs to, you know, step up and move that way. That's great, and I, I think to think that that there are models to follow, um, and, and for us to think globally about those models is a really great segue into our question for, for Raffaella, but also there was something, again, just that's seven out of 10 of the worst paying jobs in the US are in the food system. And then, and then when you weave in Bill Gates and, and the people that are actually controlling the system and the amount of influence they have, you know, for some reason, those two things for me, they made me remember this commercial when I was young. It was a McDonald's commercial about Calvin getting his first job. And Calvin was like this young black guy in a black community and everyone was celebrating Calvin for getting his first job, right? It was like supposed to be a, a really big, you know, achievement for Calvin. And, and in a lot of ways, the food industry has tried to make their workers Calvin, right? They want you to think that their workers are high school students working part time, or that they're just young people getting their first jobs. When in actuality, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of food workers are trying to feed their family and are receiving the worst wages in America, right? But the influence that the, the these systems have on creating a picture of who they're supporting and, and, and how they're actually good for us um, is, really, is, is really a powerful one. But I wanna um, move back into, I might be dating myself with the Calvin commercial a little bit too. I saw Jessica nodding her head, I'm not sure um, everyone, it was a whole campaign. Um, but I wanna move into models um, to follow um, and, and pose our next question uh, to, to Rafaela. Um, which is, you know, from farm workers to meat packers to restaurant workers, um, millions of people working hard to grow, prepare, and deliver our food. Yet food chain workers deal with some pretty extreme forms of abuse and exploitation. Can you talk about some of the challenges that workers face and the work that the worker-driven social responsibility network and partners are doing to, to build models? Thank you, Casey and Raj and Jessica. I think, yeah, you all have we share the same um, theory on why we're here and how we can get out of it. And I think I don't want to repeat what Raj said about capitalism and, and why workers in the in our food supply chains are exploited daily. I do. Well, I'm in Immokalee right now, um, working with the coalition of Immokalee workers. Immokalee means your home in the Seminole language. And yeah, grounding us in, you know, conditions that workers face, uh, grounding us in Immokalee, um, to put it into perspective, this, this downward pressure, right, coming from corporations, coming from rich people that end up impacting workers at the bottom. And what that looks like is a bucket, right? A bucket being filled with tomatoes for us to purchase at the store is 30 pounds, 32 pounds actually. And can anyone, and I know that like everyone else can't speak, but maybe our speakers, how much do you think a worker gets paid for 32 pounds of tomatoes? So they get paid per bucket in the US, right? 20 cents. You're too good, Jessica. You got to, you know, <laughs> $8. Somebody said $8. Um, Jessica is a lot closer to what it is. It's 50 cents per 32 pounds of tomatoes. And in the fair food program, which we'll be talking about is 60 to 65. That is one of the shifts in um, 
money going directly to farm workers. Yep. So that is, you know, stats on workers wages, um, for example, working with dairy workers in Vermont, they work 12 hour shifts starting at 3am with no day off. And that is, if you can picture yourself in Vermont in the middle of winter, waking up to milk over 500 cows 12 hours straight, day in day out without a day off, that is the food system that we live in. And, you know, there's in the US, there's OSHA, there's the DOL, which are departments that are supposed to protect workers, regardless of status, race, anything. But if you think about the fact that OSHA has one investigator per 70,000 workers in the US, then that's the answer of how enforcement is going in the US and protecting workers. Um, there is no system that actually protects those at the bottom. And that is why workers starting with the coalition of Immokalee workers and, uh, and through their fair food program and the Bangladesh Accord decided that enough was enough and that we needed to think about the power that existed at the top of these supply chains, that it wasn't going to be the government who was gonna fix this, but rather the workers coming together and saying, hey, corporation at the top, you're the reason why we're here. You're the one that's paying this much for our work. And you're putting pressure at every layer of that supply chain to make us be the most exploited. And so the Coalition of Immokalee Workers to their Fair Food Program decided to create the WSR model. And that model shifts power to workers by a, a number of things. One is that these programs are not created by random academics, not, no offense to academics, <laughs> but these are workers, right? These are workers coming together in their community and saying, these are the conditions we need to live a dignified life. And that code is then part of a legally binding agreement with uh, corporations at the top. And what that legally binding agreement does is that it uses the power that companies have at the top to say to suppliers, you need to comply with this code. Here's an economic incentive to do so. And if you do not comply with this code of conduct with these rights to protect workers, then you will no longer be part of my supply chain, right? Because that is the power that a corporation has, but does not use. They don't use their power to then to shift things towards uh, workers and protecting workers. And so currently, as, as, as Casey mentioned, I was part of that expansion um, of the WSR model in Vermont with uh, workers from the organization called Migrant Justice, where there was a campaign against Ben and Jerry's and um, Ben and Jerry's eventually signed to protect workers there. And I guess that backing up a little, after the, the Fair Food Program was implemented and the Bangladesh Accord was implemented in the garment industry abroad, folks that allies as well as these founding members decided, how do we continue to spread this model? This is successful. This is shifting power towards the bottom. Granted, in our current capitalist system, we're not you know breaking that piece down. We're, it's not a co-op system. But how do we spread this model? How do we support worker organizations that, that want to continue doing this? And so that is how the WSR network, which is where I work, got started in 2015. We said, how do we you know, provide technical support to workers? How do we debunk all these greenwashing labels that, that pretend to protect workers but aren't? Um, and so that's how the network got started and, and how, you know, migrant justice in Vermont got connected with CIW and implemented their Milk with Dignity program. And currently we're also working with construction workers. So we're going beyond food, working with construction workers in uh, Minneapolis with CETUL, Centro de Trabajadores Unidos en la Lucha and also uh, working with poultry workers in Arkansas and just continuing you know, to, to empower workers and give them the tools they need to create a WSR program and make corporations accountable. That's the short version, I'll stop there. <laughs> and in, in the chat, there's more on the campaigns that Rafaela was talking about. 
Um, it took years for dairy workers in upstate Vermont and New York to get Ben and Jerry's to the table a lot longer than it took for Ben and Jerry's to name some social justice flavors after Colin Kaepernick, but that's um, another story uh, for another panel. But there is something I want to come back to, which is questions of, of power over our food systems, control over our food systems and, and land ownership. And you know, we've been talking about some of the people and organizations that wield a lot of power. There was uh, there's also politicians that wield a lot of power over policy and our current mayor in New York City here, I remember his comment about um, wanting people to go back to work um, and then something about low skill workers and he named cooks um, and people who work at Dunkin' Donuts, right? Like there's also very much a, a narrative that that's built around devaluing people who keep our food systems running. Um, but they are organizing, as, as Rafaela said, those folks are organizing to build collective power. And so this is just for anyone on the panel, why is, it in so, why is it so important that we're able to shift power over who controls land, over who controls our food system throughout the supply chain? And, and how are some ways people are organizing to, to shift those dynamics of power? I could be super quick. I would say the why is it important? It's because of what Jessica and Raj said, because the system the agricultural system that we continue to use was built upon slavery, right? So it was never valued work. It was always, who can we exploit the most to continue feeding the rest of us, right? And so if we do not shift that narrative and say, the exploited people will no longer be just exploited, but rather we'll be the ones providing the solutions, we'll be the ones with power and, and we will continue to shift slowly, at least with, with the network and the WSR model, the power that um, these corporations have, that's, that's why, right? Because there's no way that the system that we have is, is ever going to value the work of black and brown people, the, woke, the work of immigrant people, the work of women. Who, who do put that food on our tables, who do you know, serve us at that restaurant. Um, so I'll jump in, but Rafaela actually said much more succinctly and beautifully than what I'm gonna say, but I'll jump in as the economist and give the, you know, another kind of answer and say the same thing. Sorry for any repetition, but so we need to shift the power right because we need self-determination and community control, right? Because those are the only ways that, again, the communities we care about, the, the majority, right, of the human population, right, needs to be in control of the food systems, not that one, not the one percent, right? And why is the one percent in control? Because as we said, we're in a racial, gendered, capitalist world system, right? that alienates us from our labor, it alienates us from our land and our food, right? It was developed, it developed that way, it started that way, right? That's why we call it racial and gendered because capitalism didn't start in an isolation, right? All the intersections uh, that um, Raj was talking about, right? Um, so we, we need to figure out how to bring those systems back into our own control, right? Into the control of regular ordinary human beings the majority of us, right? We need to make the decisions. We need to be able to steward our own land for the next generations. We need to be able to feed our current generations. We need to combat climate change and environmental degradation, which also are a result of in great part of capitalism, right? Because it exploits not just human beings, but it exploits nature and mother earth, right? So we need to be, I think we need to be, we need to know the enemy. We need to name and know the enemy right? Sometimes if we don't name the enemy, then we don't create the right solution to address the real structural problem, right? We just do the surface. So that's why I want to kind of repeat some of that, right? Um, and because our current system so dishonors people and nature, we've got to figure out how to reset that balance, especially before it's too late. Um, but, the, but I also want to say the other reason we need to shift the power is because even when we try to reset that balance, even when we try to, you know, operate with mutual aid and cooperation and collective action, 
right? There's unfair competition, there's retaliation and sabotage because we haven't actually wrested the power from those, those uh, you know, the 1% who are holding it. So we need to both understand why we need to change the system, but we also then need to figure out how to wrest the power away from them because even as we start to do our own, and I'm a big proponent of doing things small and locally to start with so that we get practice with how to do it right and how to regain our humanity and unalienate ourselves. But we also have to be really cognizant of the more we do that and the bigger we get, the more we're a target for sabotage if we're not also simultaneously undoing and taking, resting the power away from those power centers. I'm, I, I'm, I want to build on what Rafaela and Jessica have said just because you know, I mean, demonstrably taking power works, right? The, the, the reason to take power is because when you redistribute it more democratically, things work out better. Uh, and there is very good evidence to suggest that, uh, you know, when communities are in charge of land, uh, they do a much better job of stewarding it than the private sector or indeed the government. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we have data that, that, that suggests that this is what we need to do. Um, and uh, I, I think I'm, I'm drawn by your point, Jessica, about, well, it, it also then paints a target on us. Uh, and, you know, I, I mean, I began with Ayanda Ngila um, and the, the work of the South African Shack Dwellers Movement. But, you know, at, at some point, I think that that's inevitable and uh, ultimately a good sign. Like uh, in, in this, uh, this documentary I was, I was lucky enough to make, I, I learned from a Malawian activist um, who said uh, that she, you know, she, she had this huge conversation with a white farmer in America about climate change. Uh, and he was just like, no, that's not true. This is just God's will. You know, it's just a cycle, you know, half a dozen other kind of climate change skeptic stuff. Uh, and she goes, oh, this is great. Change begins with denial. Like what, what, he's not pitying me. He's engaging with me. He's fighting me. That's great uh, because soon he's going to be the guy who actually just sort of just uh, moves forward. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the fact that we're in so many fights right now, we, we need to embrace that a little bit because, you know, it's just like that Gandhian idea of first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Um, we don't get to win without going through the fight. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right, Jessica, but the, the, the fight is dangerous too. Uh, and we do need to, to, to guard ourselves. Thank you for that. So uh, what I'm going to do now is mix in some questions from our audience, see how much time we may have um, for a few more questions that we had lined up. But there was an interesting um, question that I see in the chat here um, that's free for anyone to take. So this question is, how does food charity impact food and land sovereignty for people of color? And how can it be manipulated or changed to work in our favor cooperatively, right? So some of our biggest kind of charitable organizations throughout the US are food donation um, organizations. So how does food charity um, impact um, how we control our food systems and land sovereignty for people of color? Oh, no, after you, Rafael. Um, I guess what I would say is, again, would love the definition of food charity a little bit more, but from what I'm assuming, um, I think food charity is a symptom of this system that we're talking about that we need to get rid of, right? Food charity in my mind is, you know, donating food for those who don't have food. It's putting a bandaid on the problem. It's not that there's not enough food to feed the people in this country, in the world. It, it's that the people who labor to get that food on the table cannot feed themselves because of the conditions that they're in, right? So we need, the reason why food charity exists is, is because we're not actually addressing the root cause of that problem. And so I think your, your, the second piece of that, Casey, was you know, how, or the, the, the question was like, how can we use it or change it to work in our favor? Um, maybe very simple and unattainable, but food charity shouldn't exist. And the people working on food charity should be working on the root cause and root issues so that workers can feed themselves. Um, yeah. 
I, I, I think that's exactly right. And, the, you know, the, there is a dignified emergency among the working class right now. And, that, you know, this is not to say, you know, stop feeding folk, uh, but this is to say, look, that this is a way in which Walmart is able uh, to make sure that its workers get to pay, be paid pathetically low wages is because they know that, that SNAP is there to pick up uh, at least some of the slack. And of course, who advocated for SNAP? Who advocated for the food stamps originally? It wasn't, a, interestingly, a working class movement. It was driven by grocers and retailers um, who wanted an alternative to government distribution of food. And so the, the system of uh, official state charity that we have is itself demanded by not the working class, uh, who would who would want much more what Raphael is uh, demanding? But instead, it's it's demanded by the grocers who take a very fat profit off the top of it. And so, is there an alternative? I mean, I love the Black Panthers because uh, you know they understand that you this is about survival pending revolution, right? You you need to you need to recognize that that we need to survive right now. But these survival programs are only about hanging on until we get something much much better. And so, you know, the Black Panthers survival programs were a, a just textbook way of. Um, actually, you know, bringing community together and building the political theory, right, the, the understanding of how it is that we can do things differently. And of course, that's why there was a very large target painted on the back. And again, this gets back to your point, Jessica, that, that it, there's, there's danger in doing the right thing. Yeah, I'll just follow up on that. Thanks, everybody. These are fabulous answers. I almost feel like you don't even need me, but I'll, I'll say a little bit more. Um, that the, the other thing that to me is so fascinating about this survival pending revolution programs that um, the Black Panthers exemplify is the learning by doing and practice, right? One of the things, you know, the older I get that I get so frustrated is, is when people even like democracy and collectivism, they wanna impose it from above and just, you know, people are supposed to wake up one morning and suddenly be cooperative and work together and whatever. It doesn't, right? We do it because we practice it. So that's the other reason why we've got to start doing these things, even if they're going to be small, even if they're going to be targeted, right? We have to do them because we've got to practice how to do it right so that when we do assume power, take the power, shift the power, move into these new systems, we already know, right? We already know what we're doing. We know how to do it well. And so I think that's, a, that's the other piece of this. We've got to start where we are, right? Make the road as we're walking because that, that journey is such an important learning journey. That's also what helps us develop trust and solidarity with each other. In addition to develop skills and hone our skills, it helps us to work through the conflicts to get to better places, right? Um, and it strengthens us so that when we do have to really fight and take that power from others, we're much stronger and a much better position to do that. That actually brings me, um, to my next question. So, you know, our systems and those that benefit the most from them often pit exploited and marginalized people against each other. And I, I was listening to a Robin D.G. Kelly um, interview the other day where he was talking about racial capitalism. And he said, you know, yes, absolutely. One of the main elements of, of racial capitalism is the devaluing um, and exploitation of people because of their race and, and gender, but, but also that it creates and has created a class of, of white workers who are also exploited, but actually don't see themselves at all um, collectively with the other class of, classes of exploited workers. Um, and so my question is, what can we learn from our history or organizing happening today about how we create the con containers and conditions to bring exploited workers together, to bring exploited people together around a shared vision for just and equitable food systems. You know, and, and just briefly, I'm thinking of, you know, thinking of the United Farm Workers and we mentioned the Black Panthers and how the, the great boycotts in the 60s, how Coretta Scott King was a major advocate, you know, of the boycotts, how Panthers and, you know, Panther Party in New York and New Haven and other places were supporting United Farm Worker boycotts, you know, across the country, there was a real collection of folks that were struggling um, together and now we're coming together. How do we create the containers today um, for that type of solidarity um, across movements and across people to build the power that we need um, to shift these power dynamics? Small question, I know, just for a, a, a webinar. <laughs> Well, in the co-op history, 
One of my favorite examples is the Knights of Labor from the 1800s, 1880s. Um, one of the reasons why that's such a fascinating example to me is because they, they were basically a, a, a white labor union. But again, during that period, you couldn't be just one thing because there were so many needs. And I don't, you know, I don't want to do a whole history period. It's, it was right after the reconstruction period fails. It's the rise of white supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan, et cetera. And also the beginning of the rise of the big, what the railroads and all those kind of things. So the, 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 um, these early uh, labor unions were really progressive and they recognized that need for the coalitions, right? They understood, but right? I think one of the mottos of the Knights of Labor was that, you know, we can't, we, you know, white and black labor have to unite because otherwise they'll divide us and we'll be weak and labor won't be able to achieve anything. So they were integrated. They also believed that women, right? That women were workers and women workers had to be recognized. They believed in co-ops. They did co-op development, especially worker co-ops, because that was another way for labor to get rights. They were a political party. They were part of the populist party, right? So this whole combination, but also seeing that they had to be interracial, not just co-ed, not just right. You know, there's a, a fantastic story about in Richmond in the late 1880s, they took over, they ran for office and took over the city council so that slave labor wouldn't be used to rebuild the um, town hall, the city hall, right? They used worker co-ops, black and white labor with women uh, to do the city contracts, right? So really fascinating. And But I think the core, there were two things that were the core. One of the core was that all the leadership worked together, even though this was Richmond. Richmond had just started instituting segregation, right? So the, the chapters had to be separate. There was a black... Knights of Labor chapter and a white Knights of Labor chapter, but they were, had the same platform, right? So even though they couldn't meet in the same room, right? Underground, the leaders met and whatever and developed the platform with the rank and file. And then at these separate meetings, they all had the same strategies, um, argued for the same policies and fought for them and won them in their own areas with this unified strategy. I mean, it's really just fascinating history. I don't want to get too much into it, but I think we need that kind of leadership, that kind of understanding that even if we have to do segregated stuff like the black folks have to be in their own meetings, there still can be this unified collective overall strategy program that everybody follows. And I think the second piece that I found so important in all the work I've done is strong organizations in general. None of the, uh, I'll say it the other way, all of the periods in U.S. history that I found the most Black co-ops were periods when there were strong Black organizations that were promoting co-op development, co-op education, even if they had to do it under the radar quietly. Um, there's that, com that, that combination. And so I think we've got we've to replicate that kind of thing. We've got to have organizations that are very clear about these are the values, messages, this is the path forward. And then right, leadership and strategies that'll make sure we all do that path, recognizing the intersectionalities and coming together to realize that we can't achieve it without all of us who are exploited working together. That's wonderful. Roger, Raffaella? Yeah. Can't say fairer than that. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> I don't have something to add necessarily, just that, yeah, we need to, in my day-to-day -day experience, I think organizing black folks and Latinx folks, you there's the basic of like language and, and so many of the communities I work with don't speak English and, and that being a limiting factor. Um, and I would say, Th that is one, but I think continuing to highlight, and I think this is done through strong organizations, like Jessica was saying, the commonalities, right? Because you can list endlessly the differences between Black communities and, and, and within the Black community, right? Are you, do you label yourself as African American? Do you label yourself as an immigrant? Like, where do you stand in that range of labeling? And then that Latinx community. And I think a, a 
good, strong organization will end up finding the, the glue between those, right? The fact that we are both at this Amazon warehouse and it doesn't matter whether I'm undocumented and you've been here for three generations. It matters that we're both being exploited by, by those above. Um, yeah. Or Starbucks or the many other places right now where we're seeing cross-class, cross-racial organizing happening. Um, so I think to, to close this out, because we are coming up um, on our time that we promised to have everyone with us tonight. Uh, you know, we've talked tonight um, about worker co-ops, about worker-driven enforcement, about global, global movements, about local work that's happened. I would really be interesting if our panelists tonight can just kind of close us out with your thoughts on where are we going, right? Like what comes next? What is next in the struggle for food equity, in the struggle for control over land, in the struggle for control over the food systems, both here and globally? Um, where are you seeing things that are inspiring you? as we move forward? Where are you seeing things that make you hopeful um, for the future? Um, and, and what is you know, something that you wanna leave with the rest of us that wanna learn more, wanna be um, more connected and engaged in these struggles? I can start. Um... That was like five questions, Casey, just so you know. I was like, wait, which one was the first? Um, something that gives me hope, um, and I would encourage everyone to do this, is connect with real people, connect with workers. Like, And by connect, I mean like talk to them in person and, and go to places where you can do that, if that is accessible to you. Um, because workers who are organizing give me hope, you know, the fact that they are working and organizing is, is in itself a win in my book and, and continues to inspire me to spread the word about the work that they're doing. Um, what is needed? A lot is needed. I think a lot of um, turning down the volume on solutions that aren't created by those who need it the most. And, and it, I don't, believe that our society or a capitalist patriarchy all of the that, that the system that is currently here with us is not going to turn that volume down so individually or collectively as communities we need to start kind of figuring out what to listen to and figure out where that voice is coming from so that and being critical as to where those solutions are coming from and and not just buying what is easiest to swallow but rather thinking of where the solution is coming from, who is speaking for who, and making sure that that is the, like dismantling these systems that we, that are no longer serving us. I forgot the rest of <laughs> the question, but great. I'll leave it that there. Was, that was, that was, that was great. That okay. was great. Uh, Roger, Jessica, go ahead, Jessica. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't really say it much better than Raphael. I just wanted to say that what gives me hope is I feel like, you know, especially since COVID, we're just talking about this stuff more. Like, I think people, even though people are so confused about, um, the responses of frontline workers and, uh, food service workers and stuff in terms of some of them refusing to, to work under the conditions, right? But I think people are starting to understand why people are finally starting to say, right, I'm not working under these conditions, right? I, I can't put my health and my family in jeopardy just to have a job, right? It's changing the conversation, I think. So I feel hopeful between, you know, the rise in mutual aid, the rise in uh, people realizing, right, these capitalist jobs are not, right? They're not what human beings, what we should be doing as human beings, right? I feel hopeful that more and more of us are realizing we need to change, think about alternatives, change the dialogue, think differently about work and jobs, what those mean, and what 
right? What it means to be safe as human beings, what it means to have real food justice and other kinds of justice, right? I feel like just that we're, we've got more of that dialogue going, more people are, are paying attention to what's happening and why and what the needs are. So that gives me hope. I, I put a couple of names of organizations in the chat, Federation of Southern Co-ops that I mentioned, but also I'm very excited about all the stuff the National Black Food and Justice Alliance does. Um, there's the Bugs, Bur uh, Black Urban Growers. I know there's a lot of other organizations, but I just happen to have that list. I had it for something else. Um, so again, the fact that we have organizations that are either strengthening or cropping up, that we have more alliances, that, that gives me hope. Um, and I think we need more conversations like this, right? People need a good sense. We, we need a good place to get the analysis to also help motivate us to then go out and join these organizations or create these organizations or support these organizations that are already doing these wonderful things to make sure that it just, that it keeps happening and we keep moving toward bettering of life of human beings, right? And no longer are satisfied with just surviving, right? But that we really in, insist that we be able to thrive as human beings. Uh, I, what they said, uh, but uh, I, 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 look, I, just super quick, I, 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 I like, I, I want to fuse, if I can, uh, without mansplaining exactly what you, you all just said, which, which is, look, uh, at, at some point, the theory and the praxis come together. And one of my, one of my favorite people who did this was uh, a Texan called Emma Tenayuka. I just sort of uh, threw a, a link to, to her work, but she, she was a part of the Pecan Shellers uh, strike here. Uh, and yes, you know, she was a communist, which is where she got her theory, but then she was also on the ground in movement time. You know, it, it, movement time is different from NGO time. NGO time, you clock in, you clock out, done. Movement time is, you cook together, you look after each other's kids, you're scampering around, you, you figure out, like, you're going hungry, great, well then let's let's figure out how it is that we, we get food to you. People are going hungry on strike, fine, we'll do it. We'll, we'll do lots of sort of whip rounds at, um, at, at, at the churches to make sure that you are in a place where you can fight. And the fight ended up being not just about wages, but about taking on the INS, about you know national identity, about you know who, who is legal and who is not. And this is a strike in the 1930s, um, but that, idea of look you've got your theory but you have your practice you have your um what you learn in the movement that that is itself a school it's a university of struggle um and i i you know th that's alive in america it was alive in the rainbow coalition of the 1980s it's alive in the electric co-ops in mississippi right now it's alive in struggles not just in america but around the world uh, and I'm heartened and uh, honored to be in this, just in a conversation with two practitioners of that, uh, but also uh, you know, under the umbrella of, of this movement and of, you know, of, of so many people doing the work, uh, because it's only together with that, that dialectical relationship between theory, which we need, and practice, which we all also need, uh, that we'll, we'll make the change happen. I want to thank all three of you for the conversation tonight. I want to thank the, all of our guests, attendees, for joining us. I want to encourage people to the point that the conversation doesn't have to stop here and the learning doesn't have to stop here. We've left a number of great resources in the chat throughout the night, uh, including links to Raj's documentary and book, including links to Jessica's book, including links to other people's work and, and other organizations that you can learn more about. There is no wrong place to get started if you wanna be engaged in this struggle, if you wanna be engaged and connected to organizations, there's no wrong place to get started. Wherever you can get started is the place to get started. So I wanna encourage people um, to please join the struggle around equitable food systems, around land ownership, around. And once again, I wanna thank everyone um, for the conversation tonight. We will send everyone uh, a link um, to the recording. Um, if there was anything you missed, um, to, to hear again, and we hope to see you on the next conversation, and we want to wish all of our panelists good luck with all of your work going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rash, Jessica, Casey. Have a good night. Thank you all. Yep. Okay. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to the yep. audience. Thank you.